Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for January 2021. This month we're going to talk about the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 14 lunar landing mission, the constellation of Canis Major, the Quadrantids meteor shower and the planet Mercury. Let's start by taking a look at the moon and we'll begin on the 1st of January looking towards the southwest and we're about six o'clock in the morning here so you'll need to be an early riser for this one. And if you can find the moon close to the constellation of Cancer, if we zoom in a bit, you'll see that it is a gibbous phase, the waning gibbous on the 1st of January. And if you take a look with a pair of binoculars, you'll see that it's again close to the beehive cl cluster in Cancer. And um, the beehive cluster is a large open cl cluster covering about three full moons worth of the night sky. And if you have good vision and you have a nice dark sky, you might be able to spot the beehive cluster as a faint smudge. Um, with it being so close to an almost full moon on the 1st of January, you will need binoculars to be able to see it. The moon's glare will wash it out and you're not going to be able to spot it with your naked eye. Um, if we just zoom back out and go to the moon itself, this month is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 14 moon landing, um, which was launched on the 31st of January 1972. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about the Apollo 14 mission and what it was trying to achieve. Um, and its goal was to investigate the geology and the impact ejector around the Mare Imbrium. This is the Mare Imbrium that I'm ringing with my mouse now, or the Sea of Rains, or Sea of Showers. And the Apollo 14 mission actually landed in the uh, Fra Moro area of the moon, just below the Copernicus crater. So here's the Copernicus crater, and the landing site was somewhere around here. And it collected samples um, which gave clues as to when the Mare Imbrium was formed and the composition of the material that was thrown up by the impact um, and they were able to use that to decide the age of the Mare Imbrium. Uh, the mission itself was commanded by Alan Shepard who was the first American in space and he famously paid, played golf on the moon during that mission as well. Going back to the area around the Mare Imbrium, there are a few things that you can try and spot while you're looking in this area. So you can look for this little bit that has been punched out, looks like it's been punched out of um, the sea, and that is known as the Bay of Rainbows. We've also got this crater here, this is a dark crater, so it has a dark floor, um, it's older than the lighter craters that you see, and that crater is known as Plato. Um, if you have a telescope, you can have a go at spotting some small craterlets that are inside um, the Plato crater. And the best time to do that is when the crater is near to the moon's terminator line, so the line between um, night and day. And if we just take time on a little bit, you'll be able to see that around the 5th, 6th of the month, the crater Plato will be near to the Terminator. And if you have a telescope, uh, perhaps you've received one for Christmas, then you can have a go at firstly spotting Plato, and then secondly, seeing if you can make out some of those craters that are on the floor of the Plato crater as well. Uh, we talked about the Copernicus crater that you can spot in this area and um, the Copernicus crater is a rayed crater so you can see these rays of ejected material um, coming outwards from the crater. You could also have a look for the Apennine mountain range which is here uh, and that links the um, Sea of Rains to the Sea of Serenity. Um, so the, the mountain range is in between those two and if you again if you have a telescope you can have a go at exploring um, some of those mountains. So you can see here at the beginning of the month we are a waning gibbous moon. Um, the moon will reach new on the 12th of January and it will be full on the 28th. Staying with the beginning of the month, on the 2nd and 3rd of January we have what is generally known as one of the best meteor showers, which is the Quadrantids. Um, we're on the 2nd here, so I'm just going to go into the evening of the 2nd of January. 
Here we go. So nice and late in the evening on the 2nd of January, um, the peak of the quadranted meteor shower actually occurs at half past two in the afternoon on the 3rd of January. Um, so you can either observe just before the peak, so the evening of the 2nd of January into the early hours of the 3rd, or you can observe just after the peak, um, so the evening of the 3rd into the early hours of the 4th. Um, and you can see the moon is up here, and if we take a look, um, it's still a gibbous phase, so that is going to affect your observing of the meteor shower. Um, when you're observing a meteor shower, one thing that you want is a nice dark sky. You don't really want the moon in the way, um, so that's going to make the quadrantids not as good this year um, as they might have otherwise been, and also the fact that the peak is during the day as well. Um, but it's still worth getting out and having a go and see if you can see any of those um, quadranted meteors. You'll certainly be able to see the brighter ones, um, it's just the fainter ones will probably be washed out by the moon. Now if we put meteor showers on, you can see, here we go, um, the uh, radiant of the quadranted, so it occurs um, kind of between the constellations of uh, Boötes, Ursa Major and Draco. Um, and you might know that uh, meteor showers are usually named after the constellation that they originate in. Um, and this one is no different. It's named after the constellation Quadrans Muralis, um, or the Mural Qu Quadrant, um, which was a constellation that was created in the 1700s, which doesn't actually exist anymore. Um, and a Mural Qu Quadrant is a device that was historically used by astronomers to determine the altitude of the stars. Um, and this particular constellation was removed um, from the official list of constellations in the 1920s uh, and that was when the International Astronomical Union adopted the current list of 88 official constellations. So um, despite the fact that the um, constellation of the mural qu quadrant doesn't exist anymore, the meteor shower of the quadrantid still does. So nice little piece of history there um, to think about while you're out looking for quadrantid meteors. Let's take a look and see what the planets are doing this month. So I'm just going to swing us round and take us back to just after sunset. Um, so we're around um, 440 here um, on the 3rd of January. And you can see that Jupiter and Saturn uh, appear very low in the southwest and um, still appearing really close together after the conjunction that happened at the end of December. So it's still a good opportunity to see these two close together. Um, you will need a, a nice clear southwestern horizon and you will need to look just after sunset because they're going to be setting not long after sunset and as the month goes on they will set earlier and earlier. So catch these two at the beginning of the month. Um, if you can spot Jupiter and Saturn just after sunset, then um, that gives you a good opportunity to spot the often elusive planet Mercury. And Mercury, um, January is a really good time to look for the planet Mercury because it reaches um, what's known as greatest eastern elongation on the 24th. Um, and that means that it will um, be visible after sunset for the longest possible time, be furthest away from the sun um, as we see it. Um, and I'm just going to take us to the ninth, um, and you hopefully you can see how Jupiter and Saturn are getting lower as the month goes on. And you can see, if you look carefully, um, that Mercury has just popped up on the ninth to join Jupiter and Saturn. Um, now we're only half an hour after sunset here, probably a bit less than half an hour after sunset, um, so you will need to get out um, nice and early to spot these three together. Um, and if we just go through the 9th, 10th, 11th, you can see that these three form a triangle which shifts slightly every day. Um, and uh, you can have a, have a go at spotting them. You've got a few opportunities, even if the weather is not uh, great when you first go out for a try. Um, if we keep going to uh, the 14th, and you can see now Saturn is getting really super low. So if you still want to be uh, spotting Saturn by the time we get to the middle of the month, then you really are going to need uh, a really good location with a super clear horizon. 
um, and when we get to the 14th um, the three of them are joined by a really really thin crescent moon um, so a, a really nice photo opportunity there if um, you're in a, a good position to observe the four of these together if we stick with Mercury and follow it over the following days, you'll see that as Jupiter and Saturn get lower and get lost in the glare of the Sun, Mercury gets higher and better placed for observing. Um, and by the time we get towards the 24th, when Mercury reaches greatest eastern elongation, you will be able to observe it quite a bit later after sunset. So I've just moved time on now to about half past five. Um, so we're on half past five on the 21st and you can see that Mercury is nicely visible um, above the horizon and all the way until the 24th and then for the days following the 24th you should be able to see Mercury for over an hour after sunset. If we leave Mercury behind now and take a look at the planet Mars so I'm just going to zoom out and you can see Mars is really nice and high in the night sky um, in the early part of the night. So around 7 o'clock in the evening is uh, when Mars is going to be at its highest point. Um, if we zoom in and take a telescopic view of Mars. Um, so if you have a small or medium sized telescope you might be able to make out some of these darker features on Mars's surface and you'll also see that Mars is showing a phase and it's around uh, a little bit under 90% illuminated at the moment. Also um, if we look at Mars at around the 20th of the month I'm just going to take us to the 20th um, and you can see the, the day surrounding the 20th Mars and the planet Uranus appear quite close together as well um, and you really are going to want a pair of binoculars or a small telescope to observe Uranus uh, if you do have access to that equipment then you can see if you can make out the uh, disk of Uranus and you can see if you can make out any colour as well when you are observing it using your telescope Taking a look at our constellation of the month now, uh, which is Canis Major, down here, and you can see it's in the southeast at the moment. And I'm just going to go a little bit later so that the whole of the constellation is visible. Um, so the best time to observe this constellation is in January and February and it will appear low in the sky. Canis Major appears low in the sky in winter and spring and um, it's dominated by the star Sirius which is actually the brightest star in the night sky, outshines all of the other stars so it shouldn't be too difficult to spot. You can also find Sirius by uh, finding the familiar asterism of Orion's belt and drawing a line through um, the, the stars of Orion's belt and taking them down to Sirius. Uh, Sirius is a binary star uh, and it's close to us which is uh, why it appears so bright. Uh, so it's only about 8.6 light years away. It's often known as the dog star because Canis Major is the constellation of the dog. Um, and it's actually a double star. Um, so Sirius A is the star that we see, uh, which is a main, a white main sequence star, and Sirius B is a white dwarf star, uh, which orbits Sirius A um, every 50 years. And a white dwarf star, star is um, what our sun is fated to become uh, in about 5 billion years time. Uh, when it runs out of fuel, it will expel its outer layers and leave behind a glowing ember known as a white dwarf. Um, Sirius comes from a Greek word meaning scorching or searing and in ancient times um, the star Sirius um, rose just before the sun in the summer months and the ancient Greeks and Romans thought that it was responsible for the, the heat of the summer along with the sun and that is where the phrase uh, the dog days of summer comes from. Uh, the Egyptians also called Sirius the Nile star because it always returned just before the river rose um, and announced the coming of the flood waters that would uh, nourish the lands of the Egyptians. Um, because Sirius is so bright, 
then um, the twinkling effect that you see often in stars um, can be enhanced and it can appear to shimmer and twinkle in lots of colours. Uh, so when you are obs out observing uh, Canis Major this month, see if you can spot serious twinkling and see if you can spot any colours while it's doing so. Um, and that happens because the light of Sirius is interacting with the Earth's atmosphere and it's enhanced because the star is so bright and because it's so low in the sky. Uh, it's actually led to Sirius being mistaken for a UFO. Thinking about the constellation itself, if we put the art on, you can see the constellation depicted as a dog. Uh, and Canis Major is the largest of Orion's, uh, Orion the Hunter, his two hunting dogs. Um, and it's often um, described as the, the dog with the blazing face or the fastest dog in the world. Um, and can be seen here ch chasing a hare um, in the night sky. We talked about the Beehive Cluster earlier in the month, um, around the 1st, and Canis Major presents an opportunity to observe another Beehive Cluster. This one is known as the Little Beehive, uh, also known as M41. Um, and if you can get Sirius into the field of view of a pair of binoculars, then you might be able to spot M41 just nestling down below. Uh, so known as the Little Beehive, and with a pair of binoculars, so this is the view in a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars, um, you will see it as a large faint patch of light. If you have a small telescope, um, then you can train your small telescope on it at low magnification and that will show you around 50 stars. If you have a larger telescope, then you will see even more stars. Um, and M41 is another cluster that is visible to the naked eye if you have um, a really clear dark sky and good eyesight. Let's finish by taking a look at the International Space Station. There are a few opportunities to see it this month, in the morning, at the beginning of the month and in the evening towards the end of the month. I'm going to show you one on the 29th of January at around 6.32 and you can just see the ISS peeking over the western horizon at 6.32 and if we speed up a bit you can see the path that the ISS will take as it travels across the night sky. As always you can use NASA's Spot the Station website and that will tell you when all the ISS passes are for your location so that you can choose one that will be occurring on a night that is nice and clear and is suitable for you. So that brings me to the end of our night sky tour for January 2021 and I'll be back to talk about what you can see in February.